Hi folks, so in this video we are looking at threat modelling and I'm going to tell you a bit about what threat modelling is, why you would want to do it, when you would do it. Uh, I'm going to talk about Stride in a fair amount of detail so that you can understand uh, how you can actually use that to understand the threats uh, that kind of you can fairly systematically analyze the system to look for and identify threats. And we'll also uh, talk a little bit about attack trees. And um, I'll record a separate video which will will um, give a little bit of a look on how you can use Stride using um, using some software to analyze a system. So a, a good place to start is what threat modeling is. Essentially, it's where you try and understand and document and diagram the threats that a system faces or, or a system of systems. And there's, there are different, there's quite a few different methods that you can use, um, but a lot of them are quite systematic. So they try and give you a framework and some structure to try and identify and understand the threats that exist. And when you would use it, or different ways that you could use it, include um, <clears throat> in an adversarial approach where you're just trying to break something that already exists. So you might do, be doing a penetration testing or some code review and you're trying to just get a really good, basically trying to brainstorm the, the ways that you could try and break a system. You might take some of these um, threat modeling approaches and apply them. or you can do it as a defensive approach where you're examining the threats at the design stage while you're building as a new system so that you can build in appropriate defenses. And um, Stride, for example, is designed for the defensive approach. It's really designed um, to be incorporated into software development, but it is something that you can use at any point. It's just that <clears throat> if you're going to identify that there are certain problems with the system that you need to do something about, well, you might save yourself a lot of effort by doing it earlier rather than later. Um, attack trees, for example, you could use at either stage, um, but again, it, it's kind of, uh, it's in the word, I guess, in the, in the title of the thing, it's kind of a bit more um, adversarial in nature. Um, and. But yeah, so you could apply these different approaches either during the design phase or after the fact when you're just trying to analyze the security of a system that exists. So Stride kind of comes from the Microsoft um, security development lifecycle, which was um, a big push that Microsoft did uh, in response to or reacting to some um, big security incidents as they had around that time of Windows XP and quite a bit of embarrassment around some big, huge security vulnerabilities. Um, and so they went away and actually designed a very comprehensive way of the way that they do their software development. And it's a process that we'll co cover in a separate topic. So we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, but for those of you who have heard me speak a lot, you might be, may be surprised, um, but that really I've only got good things to say about this stuff. If you have the resources um, to actually follow these kinds of best practices, then there it's an amazing resource. It's, it's um, you know, it's not going to work um, the full life cycle and everything in, in it for every software project, but there's some really good ideas there and some really um, important takeaways that we can use when we're developing software <clears throat> or analyzing the security of some software. So um, one part of Microsoft's approach is to do threat modeling and which you'll see in this in this previous diagram um, <clears throat> here. So it describes um, doing it at the design phase and during threat modeling, you should def define and model your architecture. And so all the components that make up your system, identify the assets that need protecting and make sure that they're represented. Um, you identify the trust boundaries. So that's where interactions involve entities with different levels of trust or privilege. And you identify document and rate threats. That's what this is all about. So Stride 
is Microsoft's method for doing that, uh, for identifying security threats. So essentially what you do is you break down your system into its components and then you think about the different categories of threat. So STRIDE itself is, uh, is an acronym <clears throat> for spoofing. Um, so I'll tell you about each of these things and uh, kind of define it for you. So spoofing is when you pretend to be someone else. So if I um, can just uh, join a chat room and type someone else's name into the, into the name field. Um, so for example, we had a staff meeting recently and the VC joined, it wasn't really the VC, it was just a member of staff um, that just set, set his name as the VC. Um, <clears throat> uh, but, you know, there's, there's nothing that stops you from doing that. Um, there, so the, the anecdote to that is that we're looking to have authentication so that we know someone is who they say they are. <clears throat> Tampering is where you're able to alter information and um, you know ch change things you're not supposed to be able to change so the security control that we want to have in place is to have integrity um, we know that only certain people are allowed to edit those files repudiation is where you can basically say oh no that wasn't me and um, what we might need to aim for is non-repudiation where we can say no that was you we've got evidence it was you because you know, only you could have signed in with that digital signature, for example. Uh, information disclosure um, or like a confidentiality breach um, when information is, is leaked, for example, or, um, you know, stolen or there's, you know, exfiltration. Um, the antidote to that uh, is to have confidentiality where we have uh, people only being able to access the things that they need to be able to access in terms of what the information that they, have, that they can read. Um, denial of service is obviously when things, you know, you stop things from working the way they're supposed to work, so that affects availability. Um, and we want to design systems that are available. And there's elevation of privilege, which um, you may have heard me refer to in the past as escalation, uh, privilege escalation. Uh, that's, they're just different, different terms for the same thing. Um, and really that's where where someone's able to get uh, elevate the amount of privilege that they get that they normally have. So if they start as a normal user, they somehow manage to get root user on a system, for example. And, you know, we need to have all of our security mechanisms working correctly, including authentic, uh, authorization and, uh, and the rest of it. So that's what STRIDE is. That's what the acronym stands for, but we can actually use that as part of the STRIDE system. So Essentially, the way that Stride works is you model your system as a, a data flow diagram, a DFD, and then you consider each of the elements on the diagram. So, um, if you uh, studied, you know, databases or systems, you've probably have come across DFDs before. But I'll give a quick overview. Essentially, a DFD describes all the the parts of the system, how the information flows through the system. Um, and uh, what happens to it when it's processed and stored somewhere. <clears throat> when I say the word system, um, it could mean anything. It could be a specific, one piece of software that has components within that that does processing of information. It could be a server um, that has different literal processes that are running on that server, or it could be a network of systems, um, and you could represent that in the DFD. Um, so stride it's, could be performed um, or guided by security experts but also um, it's good practice to get the people that are actually developing the software so application designers developers and testers to actually um, be involved in this process and you can use stride to model the whole system or applications or even not even a whole system you could just model a specific feature that you're interested in. So the things that we're interested in doing threat modeling about in particular is the features where there's security implications in what we're doing obviously. So if we've got a specific security or privacy feature that would be a good idea to model that <clears throat> or anywhere where there's trust, trust boundaries. 
So when you have a, um, a anyone that you don't trust, basically any external person interacting with your system, that that is uh, you know a trust boundary. Or on a on a server where you got different pieces of software that are running at different privilege levels talking to each other, again that's a good um, thing that you could um, you know you do threat modeling on. So. Um, so really, we, we're just we're aiming to kind of a, identify these threats that exist and um, aim to, to actually have the appropriate security in place. So the steps involved in doing um, stride um, threat modeling is that we start with diagramming and then we um, do threat enumeration, where we try and find, you know, basically identify what the threats are, and we put mitigations in place, and then we validate that um, you know, we've done this successfully. So, first of all, we, we used DFDs. <clears throat> it is a common way of modeling systems. I think it is starting to feel a bit old-fashioned. I know when I um, you know, did my computer science degree back in the day, um, DFDs were drilled into us as being part of system design process, and um, uh, you know I think I think it's still it's still taught a lot whether or not with you know agile software development it's still something that gets modelled before you start writing any code it won't always be the case, um, but it is a common way of modelling a system and the information flowing through it, and basically stride threat modelling. Just is unchanged. It's just a DFD. There's nothing different about it, except that we also have a rep way of representing trust boundaries. So these dotted lines that show information flowing, and um, the trust boundaries exist um, basically wherever components of a system's change levels of trust, um, or when you've got principles like programs that are running um, that have different levels of privilege that are interacting with each other. <clears throat> Most um, attacks in real life are data flows, <clears throat> are via data flows, um, and you know because of that, <clears throat> the this um, we can use this system to identify you know what our attack surface is and what threats exist. So the different components that make up a DFD. Um, Look a little bit like this. So you have processes, which is a circle, or you might you might show it as two circles if it is like hiding more details within it. Um, but that's it's just going to do something with the data. <clears throat> you have storage, which can include storing things to a disk or into a database. You got data flows, which is the arrows. That's the main thing in the diagram showing information flowing between things. You've got uh, rectangles which represent external entities like a user of a system, basically anything that's outside of our control. Um, and we've got, this is the new part, privilege boundaries. So if we look at this example here, which comes from um, an example from an OWASP document, um, they, you, know, you can see um, here we've got entire websites. So an entire system represented as a process, basically, uh, where it's processing something, you've got these different external entities, users and librarians, and they're doing, um, they're sending requests and receiving responses from the, the this website, um, which is retrieving web pages from the disk, uh, and it's doing SQL query calls and retrieving information from the database. Um, and the database uh, eventually gets stored in some files on the, on the file system. Uh, here, um, the database is shown as a process um, because in this case they you know maybe the, the database itself has some 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 code um, within this that's abstracting something away uh, but you know you can represent you could alternatively represent a database as you know a data store in this diagram but you can see here the boundaries the threat boundaries that exist uh, where you've got external users talking to our systems and when we've got our um, server talking to a database, um, and so that you know, these are different um, privilege levels that can exist. Um, for example, you could have the database running on a completely different server, for example, 
Um, and so that's at, those are different privilege levels. Um, here's another example where we've got some users logging into this web um, servlet. Um, and we've got some web pages that are being retrieved. We've got this login process. And here we're showing more of the actual processes that are happening when someone's authenticating the user. Uh, and we're using, and here, so we're drilling down into a specific feature here where we are um, authenticating you know, via some SQL queries. Um. <clears throat> so once we've done that and we've drawn our system as a, um, a DFT, we can use Stride in this handy little reference to look at each of the elements in that diagram that we've just drawn. So for every um, entity on the system, so every rectangle, we can look at, we can think about spoofing uh, rep and repudiation. So someone pretending to be someone else or later pretending it wasn't them. Uh, for every data flow, we can think about the tampering of the data flow. Um, we can think about information disclosure, someone listening into that data flow, for example. Um, denial of service, so someone managing to um, basically stop the information from flowing. Um, every data store, we can think about, um, again, tampering, repudiation, um, uh, information um, disclosure and um, and denial of service and for processes we can think about all of them so that includes you know those those middle ones that came off a lot but also um, spoofing and elevation of privilege so the, whether the process can result in someone running with extra privileges um, and so basically the the main part of using stride is basically sitting down and talking through each of these things and really hashing it out like okay so this entity have we thought about spoofing and what happens if someone's pretending how do we prevent them from doing that and you know really trying to identify all of the things that could go wrong and then we can put in those mitigations to try and um, actually address each of the risks you could essentially decide some of the risks that you identify are outside the scope of the thing that you're designing you just say yep yeah, that's possible but we accept that risk um, and or we might decide to, okay, we're going to redesign elements of this system or introduce additional security controls. Um, and so the sorts of things that we might want to do is like to try and try to prevent spoofing. We might add digital signatures uh, or, or make sure we're using authentication and appropriate authentication. We um, can look at for tampering that we've got the appropriate file permissions in place and access controls. Um, like we're using like hashes or digital signatures to make sure that um, things haven't changed, for example. Uh, for repudiation, we, got, we can put really strong authentication in place and make sure that we've um, got good audit capabilities so we can see what happens, what someone's doing once they've logged in. Um, for information disclosure, we can you know, use access controls and encryption so that you, know, you can encrypt something so that they can't get access to it. Um, denial of service. You know, make sure that you've designed things to have high availability and design servers with like failover and all those sorts of things. Um, use quotas so someone can't um, use up all the resources. Um, and for elevation of privilege, things like making sure you're using appropriate access controls and programming techniques to avoid those kinds of programming errors. Um, that's a vast simplification because this kind of mitigation could include any kind of security control that exists in the world and you know you it might be that you need to invent something new that a new approach to something in order to defend against the kinds of attacks that are possible on these new systems that we're analyzing so this is just a few examples of the sorts of things that you could consider um, and then at the end of the day you want to validate um, that the the model that you've come up with accurately reflects the system that you're modeling um, and you know is, is it actually accurate uh, because if you um, and it, it is at the right abstraction level so you know you can abstract your whole system into a one process and um, that's fine 
but is how accurate is that to your actual threats that you face? Maybe if you dig in a little deeper, you would find some other things that are relevant. Um, also, you need to think about whether the mitigations that you're putting in place are actually in line with your policies and risk management and things. And, and you know, if you're writing software that other people are going to use, making sure that it's clear that what your risk um, or threat strategy is. So what do you consider in and out of scope of the things that you're dealing with? <clears throat> so, for example, you know, email is still mostly sent in a, you know, insecure way that the, the email flows through, through the internet. Um, and, you know, that is um, basically an accepted risk uh, a lot of the time. Um, a lot, most email is not encrypted in transit. Um, and just as an example, so it's a risk that's been accepted for you know for some reason, basically for usability reasons. But um, and you know maybe you don't you don't accept it, but you should um, if you've designed a system that um, is addressing certain threats and not addressing others, you have to make sure that you've communicated that to your users of the system. Um, <clears throat> so that's a little bit about um, Stride threat modeling. I'll record a short video separate, separately to um, show you some examples of how you use Stride to analyze a specific system. But um, I'm just going to move on and briefly um, mention attack trees. So attack trees were originally proposed by Bruce Schneier, who um, has written a whole lot of really um, ex accessible um, computer security or cyber security books. Uh, he is a cryptographer um, and has done, um, you know, worked on things like creating the Bluefish algorithm and has done some really good stuff. And you know, he's some he's a bit of a public figure in the security security area got a like a popular blog and the rest of it so um, you, you know you can read it read some of the stuff that he puts out there is quite interesting as his career has progressed he's become more and more um, human um, systems oriented from going from like the cryptography further and further away from that but you know he's, he's got some really interesting stuff but he helped create attack trees it's an attacker centric threat modeling um, where you basically um, brainstorm all the possible attacks against a system. So rather than, than with Stride, where you're thinking about all the things that could go wrong, and then from there trying to um, think about um, how you could protect against them, attack trees is like, let's basically write down every possible way that someone could try to attack our system. And you end up with this hierarchical list, like this tree structure, of all the things that an attacker could attempt um, and it can aid attack surface reduction and mitigation so you can really understand what's what might be possible or what someone might try against your system. Um, you can do it graphically so this is an example um, of a graphical view of a um, of an attack tree where you can see they're trying to compromise the database and they might try to Get, go, get access via a network or physically try and access the systems. If they're going to the network, it might be that they're connected um, like to your local network or, um, you know, so it's, you know, the, the basically there's, um, you think about all the different ways they could attack all the way down to uh, the actual nodes that are like specific um, Attacks. So, trying to, for example, account-based attacks includes um, guessing a password or using a stale account and, and these sorts of things. So, um, you can draw it graphically like that, or you can just list them as a as a text, um, just a li list of like 1.1, 1 .1, 1.1.1, .1, uh, kind of like a tree list. Um, and in reality, um, that's often the easier way or the more more um, usable way of doing attack trees, um, but in terms of explaining it to someone, it can be helpful to see it as a graphical view. Um, so that's all um, I've got to say about um, 
stride and attack trees for now. Um, but this like threat modeling process is really important um, to do while you're designing software. Um, and also when you're doing things like penetration testing and security audits, it can be helpful to take a step back and think about the system as a whole. Um, and if the business has actually already done threat modeling, that can actually help you in all of the other security stages in your system, including when you're doing your security audits and things to get a good view of what the, the, the elements of the system is and where the trust boundaries are. Um, so yeah, thank you.